In today's episode, we speak to Eddie from Flowcast. She will tell us why accounting is not boring at all. Stay tuned. Welcome to HR Visionaries, where we unlock the secrets of modern HR. I'm Benjamin, your host. Join us as we shed light on today's HR universe with HR leaders and innovators from across the globe. Whether you're an HR pro, a business leader, or just curious about the future of work, this is your shortcut to the forefront of HR innovation. Brought to you by Hire, the AI talent attraction platform. Welcome to our new episode of HR Visionaries. Um, I'm looking forward to, to our guest today, Eddie. Um, great to have you here. Yes, great to have uh, be here as well, Benjamin. Thank you for having me. Um, can you introduce yourself in three sentences? Three sentences, sure. Uh, my five name sentences is... or six, whatever. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I talk a lot, so maybe it'd be difficult to give me less, but um, oh my, my name God. is Abby. Uh -huh. Me too. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this will be, this will be a jam-packed podcast. Um, <laughs> but uh, my name is Addy Tedessa Heath. Uh, I live in Tennessee in the United States. Uh, I work at a company called Flowcast. I'm the vice president of human resources. I've been with the company for seven and a half years. Uh, I started as employee number 18, and now we are just over 600 employees globally. So it's been a wild ride. Um, I really like Korean food and Korean music. Uh, I really like K-pop. So that's one weird fact about me. I just adopted two cats about four months ago. So I'm learning how to be a cat mom. And yeah, I'm just excited to be here and talk to you about all things HR. Oh, gosh. So there's so much stuff I would love to talk about. Um um, first of all, why did you join the HR space? Why did you take up a job in HR? Yeah, you know, I don't, I was never intentionally trying to be in HR. Uh, and thank goodness I fell into it, but I've always been in a service oriented role. I worked at Starbucks for almost 10 years, uh, started when I was 15 years old. I really wanted a job in high school and walked across the street, applied, and I was at, with the company for like nine and a half years. Um, and I really liked helping people. Um, I liked, you know, being in a service oriented role, but I didn't want to stay in the service industry. Uh, I ended up working for an insurance company, which was not fun, but definitely gave me more exposure to compliance, law, you know, um, making sure that people are set up correctly and safe. It, I was selling home auto insurance, things like that. And I know the Germans love insurance, um, but <laughs> <We> do, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, we don't have as nearly as many types of insurance and Americans don't like the idea of insurance. You actually have to sell them very hard to have insurance. So it's a totally different, you know, space. I'm a big believer in insurance. I've got life insurance, auto insurance, all these things. Um, but yeah, it was a very interesting time for me because I learned how to sell. I learned how to sell value and also be in a service industry. Um, and it, I was, but I was very severely unhappy. And so I did what I've never done in my life before. I quit without having another job. And I started applying for specifically early stage technology companies. Uh, I don't know what it's called today, but there's a site called Angel List. Uh, they've changed it, but it's specifically uh, seed series A companies that are looking to hire people who are okay with not being paid a lot of money, but the prospect of getting stock options. And maybe this could be the next Google, or maybe this could be the next Facebook. Um, and so I applied to about 500 places. Um, Flowcast was one of them. And I was really looking for a um, office management, uh, but entry away into HR because I kind of knew that that was an easy way to get my foot in the door and figure out, do I like HR? I like talking, I like people. Um, and so when I got a response from our current CEO, Mike Whitmire, that he wanted to interview me uh, for the office management position, he specifically said he loved that I worked at Starbucks for so long because he knew I worked I worked very hard. Starbucks is a hard place to work. Um, and I said, uh, you know, I don't really know what I want to do, but I like the idea of getting into HR. Would this role have that ability to do that? And he said, yeah, we don't know how to do that. So it'd be great if someone takes it. 
Uh, and that was kind of the journey of me finding Flowcast and falling into HR, but I ended up being good at it. I liked it. I wanted it. And then they gave it to me and here we are today. That is pretty awesome. And and you mentioned now uh, Starbucks several times. So first of all, what's your what's your favorite there? And second, how is working at Starbucks? You mentioned a working a service role at Starbucks is probably uh, pretty, pretty tough, but mm -hmm. also a good learning environment. Yeah, I would say as a kid, it was a very good experience for me because it um, at 15 years old, I didn't know what it meant to um, be in the service industry, meaning like when someone's angry at you, how do you navigate mm -hmm. that? What does it mean to like put a smile on even if you're not feeling happy? Um, you know, it's not like waiting tables. It's very quick pace. So you have to keep on your toes. You have to multitask. You have to remember a lot of things. You have to do a lot of things at once. So there's a lot of like great foundational learnings from working in the service industry that I think I use to manage my calendar, to manage my time, to keep a cool head when things are exploding. Um, and then I would say my, you know, my favorite drink, it used to be very sugary and sweet. And now I just want like a black coffee and call it a day. Sometimes I'll get like a pump of vanilla in it, but I can't drink. I just can't drink the sugary drinks anymore. I think I burned myself out from years of free Starbucks. Okay. Well, I think in summer, nothing's better than a uh, um, cold frappuccino. That's, that's like cooling you down. So um, yeah. It's it's it, it actually fascinating what you do. Um, well, when, when you mentioned well, being in the position to change quickly and to well and to 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 accept that some people may treat you harshly, not because they're mean, but because okay, uh, things are perhaps not 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 great that day. Um, how did that prepare you for future roles? Yeah, I think. There's a lot of psychology yeah. and behavioral science, even with Starbucks, if you don't, even if you don't recognize it, mm -hmm. learning how to navigate an angry customer to calm them down, to, to give them something that makes them feel valued. That's, that's HR, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of that translated into really understanding what an employee wants. You know, if they come and say, I'm going to quit, I want more money. Um, well, why? Is it because mm -hmm. you just bought a home and you have a big mortgage? Do, is a family member sick? Uh, is there something else going on that's really driving this aggression or emotional response? And what can the company do to support you? We can't always give everybody what they want, but maybe I can make you feel valued. I can make you feel like you're important here, show you a path to earn more money. Um, or maybe you need time off. Maybe mm -hmm. you need, you know, support to take, you know, leave if you have a family member is sick. So it's like not taking things for surface value, asking more questions, caring about the person, and, but then give, being fair. You know, I can't give you the moon, but I can give you this. Is this something you're willing to work with me on? Um, also not getting angry. You know, at Starbucks, it was very easy to get angry of like, why does it, why are people, it's just a cup of coffee. Why are people so mad? But everybody you know, is the center of their own universe and they really see things from their perspective. And I don't know what you did this morning, if you had a bad morning, a good morning, and it may be that I'm the one receiving all of the anger, but um, I just try to look at it as novel, like what's happening here, what's underneath the surface, don't add any of my emotions to it. And then can I help you? And if I can't help you, I want to be honest about it. Yeah, uh, you mentioned you wrote like uh, 500 applications um, when you were, uh, well, when you left your previous job without a new position inside and then applied for 500 jobs. So um, how did, so, 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 so how was it back then so to, to apply to 500 companies? I was probably hyperbolic. It was more like 150 companies, but okay. it was still a lot. Um, uh, you know, it was really tough. It was very demotivating. Mm -hmm. No one was getting back to me or if they mm -hmm. were, it was to reject me or to say, you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, I never graduated higher education college mm -hmm. uh, in the US. I went for a year and it just wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I always felt because I do not have a degree or higher education, I'll never be able to do anything. So I felt very you know, ashamed and sad. Mm -hmm. Every rejection was, I'm never going to do anything. I'm never mm -hmm. going to be able to accomplish anything. 
Um, but uh, my mom is an incredible woman. She uh, is an immigrant from Ethiopia and mm-hmm. came to America when she was 19 years old to go th- to college, put herself through medical school as a single mom, uh, and is now one of the heads uh, of the hema- hematopathology department in um, DC. And so she's always been like, get up, do try again. And so there's always been this drive of like, someone's going to want to talk to me one day and all I need is a chance. Um, but I targeted out of like the 150 companies that I applied to, I targeted about five to 10 that were my top choices. And I wrote unique and custom cover letters, you know, what's, why do I want to work for you? And, and it's not a generic copy and paste. It's a really thoughtful, um, outreach and Flowcast was one of them because I had seen a video of the, uh, co-founders and I really was like, I don't understand accounting software at all, but they seem very cool and they seem like they're trying to solve a problem. So I wrote sort of an impassioned plea, talk to me, please. Um, And the CEO ended up liking it. Uh, But yeah, it took a lot, a lot of months of me just, okay, here's another rejection. What do I do now? Let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. And even when I secured an interview with Flowcast, um, our CEO took a while to get back to me. And so I, 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 was like, I need to go chase him down. And it wasn't because he didn't want to talk to me. It's because they're busy all the time. So you also have to know how to say, don't forget about me. Can Mm -hmm. I pop some time in your calendar? And so there, I learned resilience. I also learned to be a little bit of mind them I exist and to also try to customize to target those companies that I really, really wanted to talk to. How do you uh, think this has prepared you for your future role in terms of, well, being mindful that, um, mm-hmm. well, the person on the other end um, is full of hopes or in some situations can be also very demanding. So obviously it depends very much on the position, on um, who who applies for, for what job. Uh, so so how was, was that for you? Yeah, coming on the other side as being a hiring manager, Mm -hmm. um, I try to be a little bit more compassionate to candidates, um, especially the ones that try. And there are going to be people who just don't try submitted application or not really engaged in the interview process. So like, I don't really want to spend as much time with them, but there are people who are really thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Um, Like one of the girls on my team, her name is Amber. After I did an interview, she wrote a handwritten thank you note to me. Um, and sent it to my office back when I was in California and said, I really appreciated meeting with you. I really think I'd be a good fit. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. And I was like, who does this anymore? You know? And so there's different levels of, I guess, uh, uh, engagement and care that people share with you. And then I try to meet them there. Um, but we get, I think the last time I checked, we got 18,000 applications in the last three months, um, at Flowcast alone. And so it's really hard to be super caring for every single one of them. There is going to be a level of automation or robot robotic behavior of, I got to get you to the next level. Um, and then I try to do outreach. If I see a candidate that I really want, that has no idea we exist, I'll reach out to them and say, you've never heard of me. Would you give me some time to talk about me? Cause I really I really want to hire the best on my team, you know, and and so it's a little bit of a balance. Um, but yeah, there are people who will ignore you on both sides. And uh, and then, of course, my CEO wants it done yesterday. Hire everyone yesterday. <laughs> hire the best people. Uh, so you have to balance a lot of it. But um, I think to your earlier question, patience uh, and then learning how to develop a sense of urgency where appropriate. It's really nuanced. You never know. I can't give like an exact playbook to anybody, but um, I try my best to sort of triage all of the things that come to us. What's the most important? What can be left later? Um, and what do I need to drop everything for and do right now? Uh, and I also learned how to say, I don't have time for this. Uh, sorry. You know, and I think that's really important, um, especially for like women to learning how to navigate the workforce, mm-hmm. just say no to things, but also raise your hand and ask, can I do more? And, and so I think just using your voice, not being afraid, Uh, of speaking and then being a little bit more of an aggressive personality has been helpful for me. Um, How did you learn to say no? It's one of the hardest things, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, um, but a lot of feeling like I wish I would have said something moments. Mm -hmm. um, And there's a lot of, well, someone else should have let me speak 
but I think no one can control how anyone else acts. You can only control how you act. And so I, there's no one who's going to stand up for me better than me. Um, let's try it. And I was shaking in my boots the first time I ever said no, very much like they're going to hate me. They're going to tell me that I'm fired. Um, I'm not allowed to say no to things. But when I did say no, okay, that sounds reasonable. You're right. And then you get more used to standing up for yourself. Um, I try to look at things as unemotionally as possible. Well, here's the reason why I would say no. It's not because I don't feel like it. It's because there's data and evidence to support that's not a good idea. And generally with the executive level, they really only want to hear the data, the analytics, the reasoning behind it. So if you leave behind the emotions of it, um, it usually helps your argument. But there are times when I say to my executive group, I feel so burned out. This is an emotional plea. I can't do it anymore. You have to leave me alone. Let me take a vacation. Let me, you know, take a step away from my computer. And when you build rapport with people, oh my God, yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry to bother you. It's okay. So it's a little bit of, you got to stand up for yourself. And then also there is the building of the relationship so that people can trust when you say no, it, it's, it means this is really, we can't do this. Um, well, you you mentioned then after well after after your job at the insurance, you were uh, you were very enthusiastic about um, a, a flow cars, and you you mentioned um, the sen in the sentence okay accounting and cool, which is um, which for some people it might be contradictory. Um, so, so so what did catch you? I would say it was the co-founders, the three of them, uh, Mike Whitmire, Chris Slutie, and Colin Zanstra, their personalities. Um, I, you, you're almost sort of marrying the people you work with because you talk to them in a minimum eight hours a day, if not more than that. And if you are someone that ascends to an executive level, you have really unique conversations. And so I wanted to work with people I felt like I could get along with, that I trusted, that were smart. And particularly Mike, the CEO, is one of the smartest people I've ever met. Um, and when you throw a wild idea out, or he'll throw a wild idea out, it's almost like, how do you think of that? I want to know what's in your brain. So it's almost like a fascination of how can I learn from you? Um, even though I'm smarter and more knowledgeable in HR, you still are a novel problem solver. And you see the world through the lens of the CEO and global strategy. So I know I can be better by listening to you and talking to you. And I think that's super important because you, you, you should want to work with people you think mm -hmm. are smarter, better, so you can always learn more. If you're the smartest person in the room, you can mentor, of course, but you might not learn from anybody. Um, but really, their personalities, they're incredibly laid back. They're very um, uh, unassuming and... Even if you looked at them in a photo, you, you wouldn't know that they were the executives because they don't dress it or carry themselves and, and separate themselves from everybody else. They're very down to earth. Um, and they've got, you know, really fun personalities. So I, a really big important thing for me at work is having fun. Um, even when things are tough, I really like to smile and laugh with my team. Even when things are exploding, I like to joke about it and kind of laugh about it in hindsight because I don't want anything to be soul crushing uh, if it doesn't have to be. And um, they make work really fun. They make me have fun. And so a lot of those things, when I saw in the original interview process was, oh, I can have fun with these guys. And I feel like they let me make mistakes. They mm -hmm. let me try um, and they wouldn't be mad at me. They actually encourage me. And I mean, they've literally promoted me six or seven times <laughs> over the last seven and a half years. So um, I trust them to take care of me, to take care of the team and, and and let me let me figure it out, you know? But it's not something you expect from people who are from accounting, right? So like, hey, try something new. Let's make mistakes together and learn from yeah. those mistakes. Not at all. Uh, I think accounting gets a bad reputation of being boring, stuffy, you know, tie uh, that's really tight, uh, nine to five, working in a, basement, you know, on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and while that may be the case in some places, uh, it is a very necessary industry that's a little, it's dying a little bit. Not as many people are entering uh, the workforce as accountants. There's not as many graduates 
that are seeking out accounting degrees. So it's it's a tad scary because that is like the the, the sort of infrastructure that runs companies and operations and making sure that we are financially responsible. Um, and so my CEO and my chief product officer um, were both in private and public accounting and they hated how boring it was. Uh, so that's why they ended up coming to found this company. Can we make a software that makes accountants lives easier? So we're solving a problem so that they can have less stress and better work-life balance. So we're actually giving back to the community and I want to make it fun I don't want to be stuffy. I'm not, if anyone who's watching this goes to look at our website, our photos, the colors we choose are really out there. You know, they're wacky, they're fun. There's a bunch of photos of us like doing very emotive poses. Our chief technology officer is riding a unicorn on one of our photos. So like they really don't take Where, where did you find a unicorn? So my office manager purchased a life-size statue of a unicorn on wheels and it's okay. in our office for fun. <laughs> okay. You, you said you found a unicorn, not a statue of a unicorn, if I may say. Oh so, yeah. yeah, no, sorry. No, not a real unicorn. That would be incredible. I, I don't know if we'd need Flowcast. We could just make money off of this unicorn, but <laughs> no, it's a statue of a unicorn because we are a unicorn. We hit uh, you know, a certain valuation. Uh, a billion dollar valuation. And so to commemorate it, we went out and got a unicorn. Um, but there's a lot of like, um, we don't take ourselves too seriously. Uh, we're ambitious, but not with lacking integrity. We really like to be uh, authentic. Authent authenticity is a really big deal. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they purposefully set out to say, I don't want to keep accounting boring. I want to make it great. Um, I want to make it fun and I want our employees to have fun while we're doing it, even if they aren't an accountant themselves. So while we're already at, at animals, so the elephant in the room, um, so growing an organization from 18 to 600 people, that must have been an enormous challenge. Yes. Um, it's interesting though, because every year, I look back and I go, what I thought was hard is nothing compared to the hard we're dealing with today. So I, I wish I could turn back time and have the smarts and the knowledge I have today, but you know, that's not possible. But yeah, certainly there were definitely, di definitely different stages that were challenging to get through when we hit 50 employees, when we hit hundred employees, when we hit 250 employees, I can vividly remember feeling a crunch of stress of what's happening, what's going on here. Um, when we opened our first non-LA office, when we went to London for the first time. So every time we did a first of a something, it definitely feels like, oh my goodness, we're changing the wheels of a Ferrari at top speed. So we can't stop, but we have to keep it going. And so what, anyway, definitely a lot of long, 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 long nights and weekends for me. Definitely a lot of do it yourself because we didn't have the budget for headcount. So it was just mm -hmm. me and one other girl in HR for four to five years. And finally I learned to stand up for myself and I said, I please I need more, <laughs> I need more people on my team. And so now we're a lot larger, which is great. But um I, I signed up for this though. You know, I, I really truly knew it was going to be a dip challenging. And so I think when people consider going to a company, they have to accept the bad, the good, the ugly, mm -hmm. and say, this is where I want to be. And so when tough things happen, I went, well, I asked for this. I wanted to be challenged. I said, I wanted to learn how to do all these things. Um, and so I can't really complain, but I can definitely make sure that I'm advocating when I don't think something's going well, that I'm trying to keep the wheels as on as possible and, and try to move the company forward. But, you know, looking back at it, sometimes I don't know how we did it. Uh, but I, if I had to do it all over again, I'd do it a lot, a lot smarter. That's for sure. Uh, what would you do smarter? Um, I think culture is really important. Mm -hmm. Defining what that means earlier on. I think we thought we did uh, and we didn't. Um, there were definitely some people who were maybe good at what they did, but not a, not a good cultural fit. And, and I, what I mean by that is they sort of brought a lot of negativity. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you're a smaller organization that permeates, it really does. When someone is negative or toxic or rude or bullying, 
And you're kind of like, do we let them do it? Because they're so good at their jobs and they're bringing in revenue. I would in a heartbeat turn back and say, no, it's not worth it. Um, I'd probably put more effort in hiring slower uh, to be more intentional. Um, I probably would hire different roles sooner, different roles later. Uh, I, and then um, I think I would have put more processes in place that we didn't have when we were, when we were younger. But again, like that's stuff you figure out you don't know what you don't know. Um, but I think the culture and the people when you're smaller is so important and making sure that you have a tight knit group of folks who, um, know what they're doing, a mix of know what they're doing and, uh, you're figuring it out. So we had a lot of people originally who were, had never done this before. Mm -hmm. So all it's like the blind leading the blind. We're all figuring out. So sometimes that can be a little bit scary and you need external talent. You need people who have been around the block and done this before to kind of help balance out the you're you you're very capable but the here's someone who you can partner with who you really can figure it out together um how did you maintain the well how do you maintain the this culture this entrepreneurial culture uh also this positivity You just mentioned, which, which I, I totally agree. I think it's, it's absolutely essential. If uh, if you don't have people lifting up everyone, it's it's pretty pretty tough, and it's it's not much fun then. No, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, a lot of it is just personality for me. Like I am a higher energy, more extroverted person. Um, I don't expect everybody to match my energy. Uh, that's ne that's not that's not gonna win you friends, um, but. Personally, for my team, I've demanded excellence. And what does that look like? It doesn't have to be excited, high energy from you, but it should be whatever your version of it is on, on uh, you know, that you can bring. I have some people on my team that are very introverted and more sort of data oriented. You don't need to show up and be loud on a call, but I want you to look at everything through the lens of how can I be better than yesterday? How can I challenge myself? So on the HR team in particular, um, I would say that I've hired people who agree with me and want to, you know, make the world or make Flowcast a better place. So every interaction they have with everyone, they ask the same of them. So then you kind of have a network that, you know, builds out. Um, I have very strong relationships with our VPs and our executive team. So when I talk to them, it's, it's not necessarily like coaching, but when I speak to them, okay, it seems like you have a problem. How are we going to fix it? And what do you think we can do about it instead of be mad? How do we get through this? You know, like there has to be a solution on the other side and maybe let's look at it from the other person's perspective. Um, I'm also a really big believer in admitting when you've messed up. Uh, so I am very vocal when, I, when I've messed up and I will own it and I won't blame anyone else. And I, I, this just happened the other week. I messed something up and I went to my team and I said, this was 100% my fault. Here's what happened. I diagnosed the problem and here's the solution. I apologize for any inconvenience. Lesson learned from my mistake. I'm sorry. And they were like, oh my gosh, it's okay. And I was like, yes, it's okay to make a mistake. It's not okay to hide away from it or blame other people. So I'm hopeful that like I set a good example, but then also ask them to do the same. And then everyone we interact with, we ask them to do the same as well. Um, and then, uh, hire people who agree, again, agree with that, like whatever it means to you to, to, to have high excellence. Um, it doesn't have to look exactly like me, but I want us to all agree. We're here to be excellent. Um, where did you find those people that share the vision, share those values that, that want excellent and who are also, well, able to reflect and what you just mentioned, I think it, It requires incredible strength to stand before a team and to tell them, hey, guys, I screwed up. Yeah, it's it's not perfect. It sounds like it's perfect, but it's not. It takes a lot of trial and error. Um, and I think that's the unpleasant side that maybe not everybody wants to talk about, but you do have to move on from people who aren't going to maybe be a good fit for that. Um, like some of those folks I talked about that I probably would have never hired or we would have terminated their employment uh, if we could, you know, looking back at it. Um, and also it's not super fun for people to stay here when they don't mm -hmm. feel, you know, like this is the right place for them. So it's almost like 
I know you don't want to be here and we don't want you to be here either. So what's like a mutual way that we can figure this out? Um, but the interview process is incredibly important. We've got a great recruiting team that takes very, a lot of time to understand what's the ideal candidate profile. And then how do you interview for culture? It's not always a perfect science. We've messed up, but I think that's the thing, admitting you've messed up, figuring out what happened, why we missed the mark and changing. Because if you just don't do that, you're going to do it again and again and again. And so there are some teams uh, at Flowcast that are brilliant at it. And there are some teams that need a lot of our help. And that's okay, as long as they say, you know, I need more help. But the interview process is important. I think for my team in particular, I will just point blank ask them, this is very much who I am. You get what you see. Am I somebody you'd want to work for? Day in and day out, when I demand from you, when I make mistakes, when I act crazy, um, when I message you at, you know, six o'clock at night, what's going on with this thing over here? Am I somebody that you'd want to get along with? Same that I said about, you know, the co-founders. Are you somebody that you like like, like to work with? Um, do, do you believe I'd be a good leader for you? Do you trust me? And the, mo the girls that I've hired, the guys that I've hired too, have all been like, you sound like someone I really would be inspired by. Okay, great. So if we can kind of hurdle that, then from there, it's a matter of like, well, what can I teach you? What can you learn? What can you do here? and um, hold each other accountable. But I am very lucky. I don't think I've ever made a bad hire on my team. I'm trying to think pretty much everybody that I've hired in the last five years have, has stayed with me. And so um, I, I really do think it's like, oh, you know, another thing too is, is telling them the reality of, of the job. Um, it can be tough. It can be a lot of work, work-life balance, I would say work-life integration is probably a better way of saying it. How do you integrate those two together? Um, you know, a, a lot's going to be asked, but a lot will be given. Is that something you're interested in? And mm -hmm. if they agree with me, but I kind of don't get the sense that they're bought in, I, I, I'm like, I'm not sure if there are someday I want to hire. But most of the people that I've hired are like, I'm seeking out exactly what you're offering. I I, I want to belong there. And so there, there's almost like a, I'm trying to sell you to not take the job and how hard are you going to fight me to take this job moment? But um, it's it's definitely not easy. It takes a lot of work and we have made plenty of mistakes that again, learn your lessons from and try to make, uh, do better the next time. Well, growing an organization from 18 to 600 people and forgive me for for always coming back to that. I found That's that okay. quite, quite, uh, quite cool indeed. Um, well, I think it requires also, well, well, there's so many moving parts. So, well, uh, stakeholders change. So the um, so the hiring managers you work with change, and, and and the organization grows rapidly. How how can you ensure that well cooperation and and the well coordination and cooperation with stakeholders works well? That you in your positioning as the the the, the, the person who's responsible for hiring new people can ensure mm -hmm. that, well, both sides are happy so that the applicant is, is, is happy, that the um, uh, hiring manager is happy. So so how do you do that? It's a good question. We do a couple of things. Um, we have a, what's called a quality of hire survey that we run um, after we hire an applicant. It goes to the hiring manager within 90 day or at the 90 day mark. Um, to ask them on a scale of one to 10, is this person what you expected them to be? Um, it's not always a perfect science, but we can catch, are you pleased with this candidate or not, you know, 90 days into the role. Uh, in the US, we don't have probationary periods, so that kind of helps with mm -hmm. that. But, you know, there's also probationary periods uh, in uh, London and, and uh, Germany and Australia that we use to sort of assess from the HR side, we do um, milestone check-ins with employees. So at your 30 day, we ask you, do you like, do you like it so far? Um, is it, is it living up to what was sold to you in the interview process? Because we used to have a problem a long time ago where we weren't super transparent and not, not to hide anything, but we didn't really convey how tough it can be sometimes. And, you know, how many phone calls a, an entry level salesperson might need to make. And, um, you know, 
maybe you have a certain title, but you're expected to roll up your sleeves and get in the dirt with everybody too. And so we sort of discovered this, this is not what I expected from how you sold it to me in the interview process through those check-ins years ago that we went, okay, we have some data in order to go back and say, we have a problem, let's fix it. So we got better at that. We also do check-ins with employees at six months and one year. And when we start to ask them, what motivates you? What's important to you? Um, do you see yourself staying at Flowcast in the long run? And we get sort of satisfaction from them. And then when we give it back to the managers to read, the manager can go, I'm very happy they're here. Or, you know what? I'm actually not happy they're here. So we sort of have these mm -hmm. moments where we like pulse check. Are you are you happy? And then also, are you uh, the manager? Are you happy? We obviously do performance reviews, you know, where we do those those check ins and moments. But um, uh, and then sort of not process driven. My team talks a lot to people. We meet with people on a regular basis. Uh, how's it going? Is there anything going wrong? How's your team? Is everything okay? Can I help you with something? And so we're always just connecting and talking to people. I would say um, I probably spend a majority of my time in meetings just asking people what's going on. What can you tell me? Same thing with the, the girls on my team. So it's a little bit of like process driven, but also just like you have to talk to people and you have to build that relationship with them for them to tell you something isn't working. I need your help because um, otherwise they'll never come find you. Um, well, you, you mentioned several times like your your company helps in, in accounting. Can you give us a, a short overview of what exactly you guys do? So you guys, and well, it's, it's absolutely incredible that you were employee number 18. So you're very at the very core of, of the company and the, the company culture and, and creating, well, you were basically, um, in, well, incredibly important to create a unicorn. So what, what do you guys do? Yeah, so Flowcast, uh, we develop software that aids accountants, most particularly with a month end close. So that's a repeatable process that happens once a month where they have to reconcile their books, make sure everything's accounted for. Um, and so the software is part um, uh, collaboration, part automation, and part uh, compliance. So uh, like co collaboration, meaning it's a software that accountants who typically work with paper, you know, like a literal an archaic paper can collaborate on in the cloud. Um, so that way, you know, Benjamin, I don't have to have a meeting with you every week to see what you're doing. I have a software to tell me what's Benjamin working on. Is he slow on things, fast on things? I can see all your tasks and assignments, the progress on it. I could see if you're actually drowning in work and reassign it to other people. Um, it automates some of the work. So it will um, automate some like bank reconciliations. We're trying to put some artificial intelligence in there as well. There's data and analytics of, you know, um, time to close, where we're spending our most effort, where biggest variances are. So someone like a controller or a CFO who needs to know these things can click open the software and read it without having to ask in staff meetings, what's the status or pour through Excel files. Um, and then compliance, when um, they get audited, uh, there's an audit trail, it's all locked and it's easier for them to pass audits. It's cheaper, excuse, excuse me, for them to pass audits. Um, so this does serve the office of the CFO. And then we are trying to branch out to um, uh, operations, information technology, maybe even HR one day, anything that's sort of um, back office, uh, general and administrative what supports the business and, and really keeps a good pulse on financial health. Uh, but that's what our software does. Yes, it's uh, some, some pretty exciting given, well, you, you you automate those tasks that, uh, well, that are just a hassle for people and then, um, well, relieves them of some tasks that can be done by a machine. Yes, and, and I know that can be scary sometimes for people, but if you can get yourself out of the weeds of administrative work, then you can be more strategic. You can be more consultative. So if anything is going, it's giving you more ability. I think some accountants work 60 to 80 hours a week mm -hmm. during the month end close. If you can work 55 and then spend maybe the extra during that hard time to say, I'm noticing a pattern. I'd like to raise it with the CFO. Here's the data to support it. You're now becoming more important and more valuable 
And so that's a promotion that could be more money, that could be career growth opportunities. Um, and so it's it's giving an avenue to getting out of the boring, I guess, accounting world um, and really be more impactful uh, for the business strategy rather than just be an accountant, I guess. Um, when you um, when you sell positions to new employee or potential employees, so what is kind of the uh, most important selling point for you to say, well, so we're at Flowcast, well, we, we are the company you want to work for. It depends on what role we're selling mm -hmm. the company to. Um, but like if we're trying to get a salesperson, mm -hmm. our pitch is usually our product is so great. You'll have an easy time selling it because <laughs> everybody wants it. Uh, the sales cycles are not that long. Once you find a CFO or a controller that sees the product, it's almost like, here's my money, please give it to me. So it's, it's a easier sell and you're actually solving a problem. You're not a snake oil salesman. You're not selling them something that is false, right? And you, I'm sure we know of a lot of companies that they push a product and it's just not good. Um, mm -hmm. So as a salesperson, having that integrity and having an easier sales cycle, huge for them. Um, we also, like on the customer success side, our clients absolutely love us. We have incredibly high net promoter scores and customer retention. Uh, and when folks churn, it's usually, when clients churn, uh, it, it's usually because they've gone bankrupt or they've been acquired. Mm -hmm. It's not because they're leaving us because our clients mm -hmm. hate us. They love us. So easy for you as a customer success person to work with clients who actually like you. Product and engineering, you're building a software that's never really been done before. That's solving not a, 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 you know, a filter on a selfie. You're actually solving a real world problem that could help in the long run. Uh, HR, you know, you're, you're able to help all of these people find their homes. You know, you, you, they actually really want to stay here. They love it here. Um, and so you can be a part of building people's careers. And then to everybody, we could be uh, worth billions of dollars. So do you want to work for a company that has their stock options could be worth a lot of money one day? I think everybody likes money. Um, and so get in on the ground floor like I did or get in, you know, at this level or the next level and you have the opportunity to create something really great. So it, it depends, but it's all kind of the same. Do you want to do something? Do you want to be excellent? Like, I don't want to be mediocre. I really want to be excellent. And, and Flowcast is a good place to do that. Uh, well, that's, that sounds pretty, pretty awesome. Um, how do you keep up your level of energy? You seem like a very energized person. Yeah, you know, sometimes I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I, I actually was thinking about this the other day. <clears throat> I don't know if I could do this again for another company mm -hmm. because I do feel very connected emotionally mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. like very much at home again at this company where I feel obligated or it's almost like no brainer. You you work so hard here. I'm always a hard worker, but I pour more of myself into something that um, I know is giving back to me. So if, because I was, you know, hired at a, a younger age at, at, a, at the 18 employee mark, given this chance, I feel very much, um, not in debt, but it's like, mm -hmm. we, we both owe each other. I, you owe me my career and I, and I also owe you all of the great things you've given me. Um, but I recognize that being in a VP position, I'm expected to hold a higher standard for myself to have more professionalism, have more integrity, have more energy than everyone on my team, um, or else who else will they look up to? So I do, I do try to wake up every day and say, I have to care more because that means that they know that I'm the standard, I guess. Um, or, uh, if I lose steam or I feel sad or upset, it's going to be obvious that everybody can feel that. So I don't know, part of me just feels like this is what I, there's no other option for me. I am going to just show up and be positive and happy. If I have a bad day, it's off camera. Um, and uh, I, I, I just think again from my mom, she's always been some somebody who puts her career first, uh, not above family, but just mm -hmm. if I'm going to be serious about my work, um, that means every day it's a choice I make that I show up and I try really hard. 
Um, and it doesn't mean I'm not allowed to be sad or upset, but I just, how do I work through it? Um, but you know, there is, there's a probably a point in the future. I'll go, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> I'll probably figure something else out, but right now I'm very much sold on Flowcast. Awesome. Um, well, Eddie, thank you so much for, for all the insights, for, uh, all the positive energy. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's always, uh, remarkable and also, um, it's super important to remind ourselves that, well, being the leader, uh, really means like, well, leading from the front, not leading from the back. So, um, being, being, being there for people to empower people rather than, um, well, through negativity, push them, push them down. So it's it's actually pretty pretty cool to hear to hear those those stories and those real life experiences. That's very well said. Lead from the front. I agree. You know, you 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 don't. Um, I, I'm 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 very much a big believer in. I'm here with you. I'm not delegating and leaving. Uh, it's 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 we're all in this together. And when we succeed, we succeed together. You all get credit, not me. They're the ones. Who, my team's the one who's doing all the great work. Uh, and then when we fail, it's, it's my fault. You know, I'm a, I'm a really, really big believer. You have to stand with your team, um, and try to make friends, not enemies with folks across the organization because they end up being your champion and helping you. But, uh, yes, that's a very good way of putting it. I like that. It, it, it kind of reminds you of those ancient Kings, right? So though, those who were in the very front line and those exactly. other who's who uh, let uh, soldiers die on the battlefield while staying at home uh, enjoying cake, right, in, in their palace. Yeah. And, uh, well, it's probably the first and not the latter that, that people would uh, would enjoy as, as a leader. Yeah, I totally agree. It doesn't it doesn't feel good to me. I wouldn't want to be led by somebody like that either. So, <laughs> uh, you can't you can't you can't have your cake and eat it, too. <laughs> True. Yeah. Cool. No, thank you so much again. And it was really a great pleasure talking to you. Yeah, you as well, Benjamin. Thank you so much for a really great time. And uh, I hope this podcast was a good experience for you too. Awesome. And all, all of you, thanks a lot for listening in. I think many cool things uh, we can we can, we can learn from, uh, from the experience. And um, yeah, see you next time. Awesome. Bye.